It's human history is simple. Things were terrible before 1895. Rent on this property has not been paid. The warning has been given thrice. Bastards are burning our house! Terrible. The average person in the West lived on less than a dollar a day in today's money, which is half the current rate that the UN regards as abject poverty. Right? You're, you're going to be pregnant from the time you were 14 till the time you were 30. And the chances are that you were going to live through that was like zero. Your parents were going to be dead, at least one of them. You were going to lose at least half your children. You're going to spend the vast majority of your time in backbreaking work. You were, your life was hard. It's hard to imagine life before 1895. Frontiersmen like Daniel Boone were hired to navigate the Wild West frontier during the times of the French and Indian War. Sometimes, folks get lost, muddled in the history books, in their stories, get lost in a translation of time. One of the rarely told stories from the French and Indian War was the story of Louis Wetzel. With very little that remains as reliable accounts on Louis's personal life and affairs, his actions as a frontiersman is what defined him. You want to know a little about early days? Much. If you were scouting, you could go where you pleased. No one on the western frontier was more feared by the enemy, and none did more to beat him back into the heart of the wilderness and reclaim the expanse domain that we now enjoy. With many, he was regarded as having been very little better than a semi-savage, a man whose disposition was that of an enraged tiger. And his propensity was for blood. Ready or not. Indians who once played the two European empires against each other now band together against the British. This would be a new war. On the morning of June 2nd, 1763, warriors from the Ojibwe and Sauk nations are engaged. Going instantly to my window, I saw a group of Indians within the fort. They were furiously cutting down and scalping every Englishman they found. The dying were writhing and shrieking under the knife and tomahawk. I was shaken, not only with horror, but with fear. Louis Wetzel, a famous scout and ranger on the early American frontier, just west of the Appalachian Mountains, he is a true American icon, but is he a hero or a villain? Almost all of the early settlers considered him a hero because he vowed to kill any Indian who crossed his path, and in doing so, deterred the Indians from striking the settlements. Others of the time considered him a barbarous, psychotic murderer for killing innocent Indians, including women and children and thus inciting the Indians to warfare against the growing population of whites in the area. They claimed Louis Wetzel did everything in his power to prevent peace between the Indians and the settlers so he could keep on killing with impunity. Deathwind is what the Indians called Louis Wetzel, for whenever he made a kill, he would throw back his head and let out a scream of hatred, rage, and defiance that echoed through the hills. Other Indians, upon hearing that scream, would know that one of their own had just met his end at the hands of the best woodland warrior who had ever lived. Land hungry and ambitious, the new country was also drastically changing its policies towards the Indian nations. And nowhere was this more evident than in the treaties. The United States' primary interest in treaty making was to acquire Indian land. And so the treaties were used for that purpose, especially as the United States found itself in a position to 
pretty much dictate the terms of the treaty. And so the treaties morph from this friendship and reciprocity sort of relationship into a very one-sided thing. There's almost a mythology about this that somehow when the pilgrims arrived, they were dragging land behind them. <laughs> There was no land brought here. The land here was Native Nations. A boy learns to hate when his society enrages it, when his friends and family applauds and encourages him for acting on that hate. The effect can cover the boy's whole life. That is what happened with Lewis Wetzel. He was the fourth of seven children born to Mary Bonnet and John Wetzel. John Wetzel was a German palatate immigrant who had survived indentured servitude and become successful enough to win the hand of Captain Bonnet's daughter in marriage. Lewis' mother was of the Bonnet family, Flemish Huguenots already several generations in America and very respected in Hartford Township, Pennsylvania. After marrying in 1756, his parents moved from Pennsylvania to Rockingham County, Virginia, where they stayed for several years. From there, they moved to Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, where Lewis was born in 1763. In 1764, the growing Wetzel family, along with some of the Bonnets, the Zanes, the Eberleys, and the Rosencranzes, moved across the Alleghenies to occupy some of the free land that had become available in 1768 after the first treaty of Fort Stanwix. Ultimately, the group of families settled near present-day Wheeling, West Virginia. The Wetzels carved out a farmstead out of the forest along Big Wheeling Creek, about 14 miles from the Ohio River, converging from the southeast. His father, Captain John Wetzel, served under General Braddock at Fort Henry. Captain John Wetzel and his son Martin were in the Battle of Point Pleasant in 1774. Martin was one of the soldiers who had survived the Foreman Massacre near McMechan and was among the defenders of Fort Henry in 1777. Martin, his brother Lewis, and his dad, Captain John Wetzel, were also among the defenders in the second attack on Fort Henry on September 11th through 13th, 1782, against the British and the Indians, which is known as the last battle of the Revolutionary War. In 1782, Martin and Lewis were among the defenders of Fort Billier against the Mohawk and Shawnee Indians. Captain John Wetzel Sr. was wounded by the Indian near Capitana in 1787 as he and a companion were paddling a canoe up the Ohio River returning from the Middle Island Creek. He died soon after, reaching the fort at Baker Station and he was buried there. His marker has been moved about two miles south to a roadside park in West Virginia State Route 2. Lewis was a folk hero to the white settlers, as he was their protector from the Indians, and he was the deciding force in helping to settle this territory. He killed his first Indian at the age of 16 near St. Clairsville, Ohio. At the age of 17, he entered into his life's work of hunting Indians. Being appointed in the scout and an assembly in Wheeling by the settlers who needed protection from their homes and family. The only pay he received was the pleasure, if any of hunting Indians and the satisfaction of serving his fellow man. The skill that he acquired in his youth of loading his muzzle loader at a full run and hitting his targets, coupled with his cunning ways, was the deciding factor in his ability to kill every Indian he saw in revenge for the torture of his family members, including himself, in the killing of his father by the Indians. The Wheeling Creek Settlement was right on the edge of King George's proclamation line in 1763, as it had been redrawn at the conference held at Fort Stanwix in 1768. That was where the arrogant and self-serving Iroquois got back at their old enemies to the west by granting to the British all Shawnee, Miami, and Delaware lands east and south of the Ohio as far downstream as the mouth of the Kawana. The Ohio Indians had neither participated nor agreed in this disposition of their land. And as a result, the Wheeling Creek settlers were frequently targets of the Ohio Country Indian attacks from about 1770 until 1795 when the Treaty of Greenville moved the Indian white boundary far to the north. Indians captured Lewis from his home 
in Wheeling Creek when he was 13. It was 1777, the second year of the Revolutionary War. The Wetzels, along with most of their neighbors, were hauled up at the nearby Fort Henry, waiting out the season's spat of Indian raids. Wyandotte raiders captured Lewis and his younger brother Jacob as they were working with their father and their older brother George. Their father and brother had uncharacteristically left their guns back in the cabin when they had all gone out into the fields that morning to hoe crops. Their father John Wetzel was a dedicated farmer for that place and time. Most 18th century frontiersmen were really commercial hunters and trappers, not farmers. Whatever farming got done, the women and children did. The Wetzel place was an exception. About mid-morning, John Wetzel sent the two younger boys back to the cabin to check on some venison that was drying by the fire and to bring him and George's guns back out to them. The Indians hit when they were coming out of the cabin to return to the field. As Lewis opened the door and stepped out, they fired a volley, grazing him across the chest and causing considerable pain and blood loss. The Indians then charged in and captured the boys. Quickly, they scooped up some metal pots and the guns and the boys were taken out into the field. They hurried off into the forest, pushing the boys ahead of them. Their father and their brother George realized very quickly what was going on, but couldn't do anything without weapons. They saw that the boys were being taken captive and decided to run to the fort for weapons and for help. By the time they returned, the trail had gone very cold and they lost it. They could only hope that the boys could get themselves out of this dilemma. Indians often kidnapped their enemies. Sometimes after testing their strength, courage, and stamina, they'd very ceremoniously adopt these captives into their own families. Indians believed in the power of transmutation, where through elaborate preparation and ceremony, adopted captives would replace and take on the character of lost relatives. Surprising numbers of adopted whites were profoundly transformed by this process and remained very attached to their Indian families. This was especially so when the captives were young. Other times though, once they got the captives into the towns, they might run them through the gauntlet until they were beaten to death, or they might burn them at the stake or otherwise torture them to death. You couldn't tell what they'd do, especially with men and older boys. The shot that grazed Lewis across his chest tore away part of his sternum. It was very painful, but he didn't dare let it slow him down. If he faltered, he was dead. On the third night, the Indians relaxed their guard enough that the boys were able to escape. The night watch was asleep. The Indians thought the boys were too far from home to try and run off. Besides, they had taken away the boys' shoes to discourage them further from running away. Once out of the camp, in a way, the boys paused to think about the best plan of action. They had to stay off the trails or they would surely be recaptured. That meant rough going through the forest over all sorts of obstacles. There was no getting around it. They needed footwear. So after telling his little brother to lay low and not wander off, Lewis stole back into the camp and got moccasins for both of them from where they were drying by the fire. Then, figuring that his luck would hold, he went back still another time and stole back his father's rifle and powder horn. Then they took off through the forest, heading back home. They eluded recapture three times and crossed the Ohio to an island in mid-river on a raft made of logs and strips of bark. Lewis's wound was bothering him and without his brother's help he surely would not have made it. Some boys from the Wheeling settlement were fishing on an island. They helped them out the rest of the way home. Their friends and family welcomed them back as if they had returned from the dead. This experience refocused Lewis's concentration for the rest of his life. From then on Lewis spent every spare moment perfecting himself as a forest warrior. His father had given him a good start in this direction years earlier. John Wetzel knew very clearly what both men and women had to do to survive in the frontier, and he did his utmost to see that all of his children, both sons and daughters, knew frontier skills very well. Lewis practiced shooting with the long rifle until legend says if the target was big enough for him to see, he could hit it on the first shot. He became an expert at using knife and the tomahawk. He was so quick and agile that in the forest at least nobody could catch him. On top of this, with the help from his father, he learned to load, prime, and shoot his long rifle while running at full speed through the woods, an amazing achievement for the time. 
His first real opportunity to use these skills came one year later when he was 14. That was when he participated in the rescue of Rose Forest. He was already about as tall as he was going to be and he had become a superb hunter. That day, his father had sent him out to warn the neighboring family of hostile Indians in the vicinity when he crossed paths with Fraser Forrest, who was out hunting small game and was about to return home. Fraser was newly married and did not want to leave his wife alone for too long. The Forrest cabin lay in the same direction Lewis was going, so they decided to keep watch on each other's company on the return trip. When they arrived at the Forrest cabin, it was burning fiercely and Fraser's wife Rose was nowhere around. Fraser was incoherent with rage and fear for her. Lewis read the sign and concluded that four Indians, all on foot, had taken Rose away with them. The two immediately began tracking them, intent on rescuing her. The Indians lost much of their lead when they had to make a raft across the Ohio. If the two young men could get across quickly themselves, their chances of catching up to them before dark would be good. They quickly made a small raft for their guns, powder horns, and pouches, and pushed it in its load ahead of them as they swam across the river. Once across, they found the Indians' raft abandoned, and where their trail resumed. As darkness descended, and they were about to give up for the night, rather than lose the trail completely, they smelled smoke as coming from a campfire. Investigating, they found the camp and the Indians that they had been following. Rose was alive, huddled against the tree. Even from this distance, they could hear her occasionally sobbing. Three of the Indians were asleep. The fourth was sitting up, his back against the tree. Frazier's rage returned more powerfully than before. He was all for firing at them right now and charging into the camp to finish them off with tomahawk and knife. Lewis put a hand on his shoulder. Wait till dawn. Less chance of them killing Rose if we get them while they're just waking up. They watched all night. Rose eventually fell asleep. The Indians changed guard and fed the fire twice during that time. It was during a guard change that the frontiersmen saw that one of the Indians was really a white renegade. Dawn came. Lewis and Frazier waited for the men to rouse themselves. Their plan was to shoot the first two to get them on their feet. Frazier taking the man on the left, Lewis the man on the right. The white renegade rose first, then the guards stood up. The frontiersmen shot together just as they planned it, and both of their victims went down. Lewis and Frazier pulled back their tomahawks and ran yelling towards the fire. The other Indians sprang to their feet and ran leaving their guns on the ground. Frazier ran to Rose to comfort her. She was nearly hysterical. Lewis continued in pursuit. Suddenly, he saw that the two Indians had stopped and were watching him. Both had tomahawks in their hands and looked as if they were ready to charge him. Lewis stopped, raised his rifle, and shot one down. The other immediately charged, knowing that the frontiersman's gun was empty. Lewis fled, reloading as he ran. A short distance in time later, the Indian closing on him quickly. Lewis turned around, took aim, and shot the second victim. They took four scalps, all the weapons, and returned to the river. They used the Indian's raft to recross and went home. His next individual battle with the Indians happened two years later when he was 16. A group of frontiersmen from further east passed by the Wetzel Field on the Wetzel home place where Lewis was working. They were chasing Indians who had stolen some of their horses. It didn't take much to persuade Lewis to join them. It looked a lot more interesting than hoeing corn. After tracking the raiders all day, the settlers caught some rest in the small meadow at the spring near today's St. Clairsville, Ohio. Once again, the Indians were three of them. They thought they were far enough into their own territory to let their guard down. Totally surprised, they abandoned their plunder and disappeared into the surrounding forest. The frontiersmen simply took back their horses. Just as suddenly, though, the Indians reappeared and stole some of the frontiersmen horses again, including the one Lewis had ridden during the chase, his father's favorite mare. Vowing to not return to Wheeling Creek without his father's horse, Lewis persuaded two of the members of the party to join him and resume pursuit. The rest decided that they'd had enough of chasing Indians and turned back. Later that day, Lewis and his companions caught up with the Indians once again. Lewis and the Indians treed. They hid behind trees and began plotting ways to get at each other. Lewis's two companions both simultaneously decided that they, like their friends, 
also had enough of chasing Indians. They ran, leaving Lewis to his fate. Lewis drew their fire by sticking his hand out from behind the tree with his ramrod. After they shot, Lewis fell into the tall grass near the tree, clutching his chest. The Indians were so sure they'd hit him that they raced each other to be the first to count coup and collect his scalp. He stood up and shot the first one. Then he ran off into the forest, reloading it as he went. Thinking his rifle unloaded, the remaining two were hot on his heels when he turned and shot the second one. The third decided to quit while he was still able to and disappeared into the forest. A few days later, Lewis appeared at Wheeling Creek showing two scalps around and telling his story to anyone who would listen. He was proclaimed a hero. Most frontiers people were sure that the Indians were dangerous subhumans who should be shot on sight. Anyone who actually did this was doing a valuable public service in their eyes. From then on, Lewis Wetzel lived primarily as an Indian hunter. He never settled down. He never took up land, built a cabin of his own, farmed, or did any sort of usual work. There was no real record of him ever forming a permanent relationship with a woman. They said he was a good fiddler player who was always welcome in taverns and dances. He got along well with dogs and children, but not so much with adults. He did not speak very well and seemed strange and unstable. He would appear fairly often on a Sunday afternoon when there was a competition of frontier skills, shooting, running, tomahawk throwing, and so forth. He'd show up and always win. Mainly, he roamed the forest across the Ohio country, hunting Indians and carrying out one-man raids. He would spend weeks at a time moving secretly deep into the forest north of the Ohio. One of his favorite strategies was to trail small Indian hunting parties. He'd wait until they made a camp and settled in for the night. After they were asleep, he would descend upon them with a knife and tomahawk, killing as many as he could before they were awake enough to resist. He wiped out parties of two or three several times this way. He also would hunt out and provision hideouts, often caves or narrow deep ravines where he could go into the ground for days or even weeks at a time if he had to. One of his hiding places, little more than a cliff overhang really, is located in a city park in today's Lancaster, Ohio. Between 1779 and 1788, he collected the scalps of 27 Indians that he said he personally killed. Accounts of his exploits, as told by others, put a total more than 100. In 1781, he killed an Indian before a large number of witnesses for the first time. It was during the American Colonel Daniel Broadhead's disastrous campaign against the Delaware in the upper Muskegon area. The Delaware had recently abandoned a position of neutrality and had sided with the British, albeit somewhat tentatively. Colonel Broadhead, with 150 soldiers from his garrison at Pittsburgh and 134 militia, managed to surprise and burn the nearby Delaware town of Kostakin. This success was blunted by the militia's deliberate killing of 15 Delaware warriors after they had surrendered. This led to Delaware burning nine captured Kentuckian on nine consecutive days. Thanks to his militia contingents activities, the main result of Bridehead's campaign was to firm up Delaware's hostility. After Kostakin, they rivaled the Shawnees in their hostility towards Americans. Wetzel's victim was a Delaware chief acting as a peace emissary. The chief had been invited to the American camp under a safe conduct and had just gotten out of his canoe when Wetzel tomahawked him from the back. Militiamen learning of this approved of Wetzel's actions so boisterously that Broadhead chose to do nothing to punish him. Sometimes Wetzel would go with others on expeditions into the forest. Often this was to guide land speculators in the areas they wanted to claim before the crowds got there that is, before the Indians had been removed. It was much more difficult for a group of traveling out into the wilderness to escape notice than it was for Wetzel going in it alone. The chances of getting involved in pitched battle went up proportionally. 
When there was a fight, Wetzel was always able to do more than just account for himself. His companions, though, were sometimes neither as capable or as lucky as he was. Indians killed John Madison, brother of future President James Madison, in the spring of 1786, while he was traveling with Wetzel on a land surveying expedition along the Little Kanawha River in today's West Virginia. As the years passed, Wetzel became more and more eccentric. He took to wearing tassels in his split earlobes. He carefully tended his hair, when combed out, hung almost to his knees. He said he wanted to give his enemies a scalp worth the effort it would take to get it. Indian fighting became the sole focus of his life. People became even more uncomfortable with him. They began to doubt his sanity. His real troubles began when he murdered Tegunta. Wetzel had agreed to be the chief hunter for the new settlement of Marietta on the north side of the river until the end of the year 1788. General Josiah Harmer, commander of the American Army Detachment stationed at nearby Fort Harmer, shows where the general's ego led. Knowing of Wetzel's reputation and woodland skills, persuaded Wetzel to act as a scout on any expeditions he would carry into the interior. Fort Harmer had been constructed and manned by American military to protect the Delawares from incursions by whites from south of the river. This is where he ambushed and murdered Tagunta, a key Seneca leader who had long worked with the Americans for peace. Wetzel murdered him right in the middle of the very sensitive negotiations leading to the Treaty of Fort Harmer, completed in 1789. The Americans, represented by Colonel Josiah Harmer, had worked for years to put over this treaty. This treaty was the keystone of the new United States government's Indian policy in the Northwest Territory. One morning, when Tagunta left the Seneca encampment alone to go to Fort Harmer for the day's negotiations, Wetzel stepped out onto the trail in front of him and shot him. He scalped him and left him for dying. Wetzel's mistake was not to finish Tagunta off. He lived long enough to describe Wetzel, the tricolored hat that he was wearing, and the grin that he had on his face as he was shot. He described him completely. Wetzel, along with many others on the frontier, hated Indians so intensely that they believed that the only way to deal with them was to exterminate them. Wetzel did everything in his power to prevent any peaceful settlements between whites and Indians from taking place. He did not want peace until every last Indian was dead. Even though most frontiersmen approved of Wetzel's motives, this ambush put him behind the pale as far as the American government was concerned. Colonel Harmer posted him as a wanted for murder, and he became a fugitive. An American regular army patrol captured him first time while he was camped on an island in the Ohio near Fort Harmer in the Marietta. It was arrogance on his part that allowed that much to happen. He thought they could never catch him he escaped wearing hand irons. The army was also overconfident. He convinced his guards to remove his leg irons and surround him so that he could go out onto the parade ground and get some exercise. Once his ankles were free, he fled to the forest where nobody could catch him. With help, he crossed the Ohio. On the other side, the first frontiersman he encountered filed and saw the hand irons off. The frontier people did not share the government's opinion of Wetzel. In fact, they weren't really sure that it was even their government. Wetzel was one of them. He was captured a second time in Limestone, Kentucky, now called Maysville. Members of another regular army group, wearing civilian clothes as they traveled downriver to Fort Washington, near what is now Cincinnati, recognized him. They took him with them to Fort Washington where they locked him up for trial. More than 200 frontiersmen, including such prominent people as Simon Kenton, gathered outside the fort. They demanded Wetzel's release. Otherwise, they threatened to rescue him by force. Territorial Judge John Symes resolved the dilemma by turning Wetzel out onto the writ of habeas corpus. He never bothered to call him back for trial. Despite Wetzel and his kind efforts to prevent it, Peace of sort finally did come in the Ohio country in 1795 with the Treaty of Greenville. This agreement established a new boundary between the Americans and Indian nations that ran far to the north of the Ohio River. The menace of Indian attack virtually disappeared from the Ohio Valley and Wetzel's star quickly faded. 
like others of the time who did not prosper after the wild frontier moved away from them. Wetzel went west and south into the Spanish territory. His name appears in the records of Spanish New Orleans. He spent several years in prison there in the late 1790s. Romantics would tell us that this is because he became involved with the wife of a Spanish colonial officer. Other accounts state that he was imprisoned because of his involvement with a counterfeiting ring. In 1804, some say he was briefly recruited into the Lewis and Clark expedition as a hunter and scout. They also say that after three months, he was either dismissed or left on his own accord. He supposedly would not conform to the expedition's disciplinary requirements. However, his name does not appear in any of the expedition's very detailed log or books, any of the participant journals. This story probably belongs with the one about the Spanish official's wife. In 1805, his name reappears in the records as living with or near his cousin Philip Sykes in the vicinity of Nashitz, Mississippi. While there in 1808, he fell ill and died, probably from yellow fever. The prize of Lewis's Wetzel's scalp by the Indians was never achieved. He died just short of the age of 45. As was then the custom in the South, he was buried in the front yard of his cabin. His cousin's wife insisted that his rifle be buried with him, saying that a gun that had killed as many as that one had would haunt any house that it was kept in. In 1942, almost 135 years later, Dr. Albert W. Bowser came down from Chicago and hunted down Wetzel's unmarked grave. First, he located Philip Sykes' farm exactly through studying the local court records. This brought him to the hamlet of Rosetta near Natchez. Once there, he interviewed elderly residents, mostly former slaves, who led him to a grave and would have become a plowed field. Four feet down, they found a skeleton of a man in his 40s who was about 5 foot 9 inches tall. Rusted parts of his rifle were at his side. There were also very long hair prints in the soil around the skeleton. They were sure that they had found Wetzel. They exhumed the remains and placed them in the small black casket with Lewis Wetzel engraved in the silver on the top. Dr. Bowser brought his remains back to Moundsville, West Virginia, where they now rest beside those of his older brother Martin in McCreary Cemetery, just two miles from the old Wetzel homestead where he started. As Daniel Boone symbolizes the brighter side of Western expansion, Wetzel personifies its dark side. We'd like to turn him into a villain and dismiss him. That is difficult. He did what he did very effectively. He was probably the best single combat fighter European American had ever produced. His courage was unquestioned. His sanity, yes. His courage, never. He made war on his enemies using their own style of fighting. Early Americans living on the Ohio River frontier considered him an outstanding public servant. To this day, Lewis Wetzel is a controversial figure in frontiersmen.